Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Meredith Goldstein of the Boston Globe's Love Letters Advice column and podcast. And this is another installment of Taking Care, a series where I'm talking to mental health professionals about getting through this scary and challenging time. And this is the fifth installment of the series. And I hope at this point you're well and safe and have things to watch and eat and do and people to call. And um, I just want to start by saying that today's event is sponsored by a local business. And I'm very into buying as much locally as I can right now. It's Garden Streets, and they send plants to your actual house. And they're also good at doing office plants, but our homes are our offices right now, so it's basically the same difference. But if you look up Garden Streets, you'll see their plant shop and you can see their cool stuff. And as someone who lives alone, my plants, one of, one of which is behind me, are very important. I am naming them, I'm talking to them. <laughs> so uh, thank you to them for, for joining us today. Uh, I, I'm so excited to introduce our guest today, Bob Linscott. I, I need to say that I wanted to know, every week we've had so many questions about how we can help older people who might be more isolated during this experience. And we've also had questions about how we can be good to our brains and our bodies. And I reached out to Fenway Health and they told me about Bob and it turns out he knows about all of these things. So Bob, do you wanna start just by talking about your own background? Cause you kind of come to us as an expert of two very important pieces of this. Yeah, yeah, so thank you. First of all, Meredith, thank you so much for, inviting me here you're doing such a great job with this so this is a real honor to to uh to be a part of this and i and it just it's so much fun to see all the positive stuff that is coming out of a time like this like this exactly the thing that, that you're doing you're doing here <clears throat> um yeah it's, a, it's an interesting question because people always say like there's these two worlds of mine like how do they <clears throat> how do they come together but i think the first part was uh to getting into working with older adults and um I think that the, the first seeds really got planted. I just finished my uh, master's degree at uh, Harvard Divinity School, and I was really I've always been passionate about Native American uh, uh, um, traditions. And so after that, doing the, the, my work there, I went out and lived with the Navajo people for a couple of years just to learn as much as I could. And being there on the reservation, I was teaching English at one of the schools, um, you can't help but to be so immersed in this culture there where the the elders are the most important part of of the community you know when you want to get something done often you look, look for the oldest woman there and that's just like opposite of what was what's going on here in the rest of of the world so i really had that 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 deep appreciation and uh and listening to my students there i was teaching high school listening to my students always talk about Oh, my elders, they, they said this, my grandparents said this, my grandparents said that, and just the reverence and respect and love that they had. My poor grandmother didn't know what was going on during that time because I kept calling her all the time, tell me stories. <laughs> <She was> like, <laughs> um, so, so after leaving there, I just had this deep, deeper, much deeper appreciation for, the, for older adults and everything that they can offer and their role, in just their critical, critical role in society. Then I went out, was off and I was teaching out in Western Mass at Northfield Mount Hermann School and was asked to run um, by the, the um, LGBT kids at school if I would run the GSA, which is a gay straight alliance. And so I was doing that. And as I was doing that, one of the things that really bugged me was that there was such this generation siloing happening. So here's, you know, youth over here and elders over here and everyone somewhere in between. And and there was no experience for LGBTQ youth to learn from LGBT elders about this shared, you know, so much of their history, it wasn't in history books or anything like that. How are you gonna find out about this kind of shared collective experience without a connection, a way to come for folks to come together? So I was able to start doing some projects during the, um, some, some conferences of, of doing these programs of called LGBT all the way, seven, I was, this is when I thought 70 was old then. Um, it was LGBT all the way, 17 to 70, and I was going to bring together these groups of, of people, all generations. And so in order to do so, I had to find out where the LGBT elders were, and the aging project had just started, um, and they connected me with folks. And so staying in touch with them and doing that program for a number of years, and then all of a sudden they, they said, um, you know, there was, there was an opportunity to come, come on board there, and I just loved the mission of, of working with older adults 
um, but also working with the elder, the just incredible elder care network that's in Massachusetts and how to, and the, the work at the Aging Project, we work with the existing elder care system to make them more inclusive and welcoming to understand the needs, specific needs and issues for LGBT older adults. So that's how I got into that, that, that part of the, the work with um, aging. And so we're gonna sort of divide this up in, in two sections because you also do a lot of work with, you know, the body and mind and meditation and these things connect. But um, tell me a little bit about, before we get going, that piece of your work. About, about the, the mindfulness piece or? Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that, that, that where I was, I've, you know, I've, I've always been, I've meditated since, you know, back, you know, right out of, right out of college, I've been in uh, doing meditation on, on my own and yoga and things like that. And we just realized that the benefits uh, from, from that very, you know, at a very early age, luckily. And then when I was working with the LGBT aging project, we had a grant um, years back from Tufts health plan foundation to do, um, to do healthy aging programs. And so we were doing these things like um, uh, nutrition programs and, and memory fitness and things like that and, and balance programs. And they were all good, but I wasn't, I was feeling that folks were, there was something more. So they wanted to really dig in more with things. And then when there was an opportunity, when I heard, when I first heard about mindfulness-based stress reduction, I'll call it MBSR, um, it just clicked because I knew that there was, I had been worried for so long about what does the effects of a long time, you know, stigma and discrimination and isolation, so much of the things that LGBT uh, older adults have held on to and had to face for an entire lifetime. And what has that effects of that stigma across the lifetime done to the physical body? And so when I heard about MBSR, I was like, and looking at the role of stress for any kind of marginalized population, I thought, oh my God, that's it. So immediately started going through and, and sought out the training at the um, UMass uh, Medical and, and went right into, into, as soon as I completed that training, right into teaching specifically with LGBT older adults um, and looking at the dramatic, dramatic results within the first few cycles of, of doing that, seeing the difference in people from going in and then going through the eight week program uh, and, and seeing on, on the other end how, how incredibly beneficial this was. And then as, as I've gone on later, then I've just been reaching other populations doing this and, and teaching both with Brown University and the Center for Mindfulness, uh, which is an, now at UMass Memorial, but I've done uh, teachings at, at, um, at um, MGH with a, a study that they're doing looking at the role of MBSR in, in dealing with populations really affected by anxiety and depression. Uh, and then I've been working on quite a lot with um, different uh, um, assisted livings and senior centers doing the same thing because a lot of assisted livings want to figure out a way to bring mindfulness into their communities because a lot of older adults are really deeply affected by, by issues, you know, anxiety, depression, worries. We get caught in that rumination. So, so that's another area where that has it's kind of really brought these two worlds, you know, two worlds together here. Well, we have so many questions from readers who already submitted, wow. uh, but I want to let everybody know that there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Please submit your own questions. If you think of them mid, mid hour, please put them in. We'll try to get to everything. And I, I'm also excited that later in this hour, we're going to try to do some sort of mindfulness exercise. And Bob knows that I am, I'm <laughs> never, he started meditating a long time ago. I am not a, not a meditating person. And in fact, often my mindfulness meditation is me just taking a walk or going to the gym, listening to Janet Jackson really, really loud so that my brain doesn't even have to think its own thoughts. So uh, I, I'm suddenly very open in my life to um, what, this, time. <laughs> what, what this kind of exercise might do to help me, especially during anxious times. But let's start with the questions. Um, so this comes in from a reader. Do you have any advice for people taking care of older adults with dementia who don't remember what the coronavirus is from one day to the next and who need to be told daily or hourly why it's not safe to go to stores and otherwise just about go to go about business as normal? Yeah, um, you know, there's, there's a number of things when, when you're thinking about how this, how this intersects with, with um, specific populations like those affected with, with dementia but you know sometimes one of the one of the things that's one of the things we're really realizing right now is the critical importance of, of hygiene and washing your hands and even if folks don't understand it 
saying we got to keep doing this. This is, this is just about being safe right now and we'll do it together. Um, and doing things in really small doses for people because you don't want to give too much information. You don't know when you're going to start triggering more, more stress or more, you know, more anxiety. Um, but so think, of, you know, thinking about continuing to reinforce the piece about, about washing your hands and why we need to stay indoors and, and, and really in simple terms of, you know, this is what's keeping us safe. We're going to do this together, you know, and I'm doing this with you. Um, and another thing too, for those people that are, that are caring for someone that's dealing with Alzheimer's, you've also got to, you always have to be thinking about, and here's the opposite, when I'm talking about mindfulness, about being in this moment, you got to be thinking a little bit, a few steps ahead, because if you are the primary care in the sole provider here and you get sick somehow, what, what, you got to make sure you think about your gaps in your caregiving coverage. Um, so, you know, what is, what is plan B and things like that, if, you know, if, if, if you get sick. Um, and then, and then sometimes in terms of the, the, the questions in dementia, like how are you, how are you helping people understand this? But sometimes maybe it's just in relatable terms. Cause you know, in, in dementia, memories kind of fade in reverse. So they won't, folks often don't remember what they had for dinner last night or maybe even breakfast this morning, but they remember so many details of their childhood. So to go back to a time to say, do you remember the polio epidemic? Do you remember how that was, what we had to do? Or do you remember the rationing during World War II? Well, that's you know, similar to what's doing. We've just got to be, you know, be safe and, and um, uh, things like that. And just, you know, so th those are some of the important things. And just, and, and also together working with um, self-care. Here's again where it bridges that gap with, the issues of, of, of aging and the, the mindfulness piece. Self-care is critical for care providers. You've got to take care of your own self and make sure your stress level and anxiety level is, is at a good place and then work with the people that, you know, that, that you're caring for and maybe just doing breathing exercise or things like that together, bringing people back into this moment before the worry starts to really spin, you know, spin out of control. I just want to say one thing, Meredith, too. I think that the I meant to say this at the, at the beginning when you were asking me, uh, you know, about my work. And one of the things I was just so grateful that, that you reached out to me for here to talk about this is one of the interesting things that has just come out of this pandemic is that we are now realizing the some some basic things and some of the most important things is how this is disproportionately affecting marginalized populations. And we're seeing this with the communities of color, we're seeing this with, with homeless people, we're seeing this with um, low income people. So many of these folks are, are, are the, doing the frontline work, so they don't have the luxury to, to work out of home or anything like that. Um, and so what you're doing here is you're, 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 you're helping shed the light on, this other, on another population and, and especially the LGBT population and how does this impact L LGBT older adults? And, and I think that folks don't, when this is what I was, you know, when, when folks may not have an LGBT person in their family that they're interacting with regularly or they're not LGBT themselves, they may not be thinking about this stuff. And a lot of folks aren't thinking about LGBT older adults. But when you stop for a moment and think about what this population has gone through in their, in their lifetime of, of what it was like when they were coming of age, when it was against the law in all 50 states, when they couldn't share their, any, any truth about their, you know, their authentic selves, because they would, they would risk you know, losing their job, losing their housing, losing, if they had children, they would lose the, the custody of their children. Everything was against them. So the best thing, fly under the radar screen. Don't draw attention to yourself, especially don't go in places in public together as a couple because you'll be spotted right away. So for so many of our LGBT older adults today, they're aging alone. Um, this population was also incredibly, um, uh, um, distance from their own families there's you know because if their families didn't know there was there's was no p flag parents and friends of lesbian and gays everywhere there's no understanding and support systems there so so there was uh, uh there's so much shame that was involved so that gap between their families of origin grew wider and wider so what do we have now we've got this population for so many of them are aging alone and and are afraid of mainstream organizations and, and don't have the connection with their with their neighbors or their elders. And so suddenly when we're all sheltered in place, who's checking in on this population? So, so we've had to go, you know, at the, at the Fenway Institute at the LGBT Aging Project, we've had to snap into gear and create this whole new infrastructure, how to really connect with all these folks because we have over the years been building up and building up 
you know, the system to bring these folks and get them connected and work with the mainstream elders that we have such an amazing um, elder service network in Massachusetts, the Executive Office of Elder Affairs and working with the, the local senior centers and councils on aging and folks have been really eager to jump in and work as, as partners with us and create these there's there's nothing like what's happening here in Massachusetts in, in any other state. We have LGBT um, community meal programs, 24 of them all across the state. Um, we've got um, social groups happening. We've got all this stuff, all these different programs. And then in a blink of an eye, all of that is just erased because of COVID-19. So all these people now shuttered in and 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 no no families and so many of these folks without partners and who's checking in on them so we've had to like scramble to create opportunities to come and find folks and check in we're doing these right now we're go ahead just go ahead sorry well no so you, you it sounds like you have assembled a way to sort of be in touch with these people yeah, yeah. um and, and what are you finding about their experience and and how they're engaging with this wonderful team of people who's making sure that they get calls. Yeah, well, it's it, we're doing just what, I mean, it was, you did the same thing. You're like, okay, what am I gonna do? Like, how do I bring, how do I reach out to more people now that I'm, I'm you know, sheltering in place here too? We realize the, the, the benefits of something with Zoom, but then thinking that, you know, so many older adults have a fear of technology. So what we've been doing, I've been working with a team of folks and, and many of those are older adults themselves and just starting small with a few people, getting them trained on Zoom and then getting them on board when we're inviting others. So we keep doing more and more people of these small little Zoom classes. And they, they, they were challenging at first of trying to get folks, think about anyone that's technologically challenged and, and trying to get them to feel comfortable you know, on Zoom and, and so doing, doing that. So that's one level of what we've been doing of, of trying to create these things. And now we're branching that into the Aging Project is gonna be doing a weekly virtual drop-in uh, every Monday at 11.30. And just to give people a chance to come in, just drop in and see and connect with each other. That's that's been great. But we're also for, for other other folks of just creating these massive volunteer calling networks to try and call everyone that we have in contact with and just check in and go through a series of the same basic questions. How you know how are you doing? What's life like right now? Do you have any any um, immediate needs? You know, groceries, medicines, things like that. Um, are you having any kind of meaningful social contacts? And so. Those, those have been, those phone calls have been going really well. The, 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 when people are getting, the, what has surprised me is when folks answer the phone and this, they realize someone's reaching out specifically to check on them. Um, they're just so blown away. And that's been a great to, great to be a part of and to get a little window into their world of what this isolation has been like. And it has been hard. It's been really, really hard. Well, one of, one of the readers wrote this question, I'm 75 and single, what is different about this quarantine for me? And I thought that was an interesting question because I would ask that question back to that person, but is that a question you can answer about what someone in that circumstance might be feeling or, or how to contextualize themselves? Don't you think you and I can both answer? Because I'm also single. So like, and you were saying it earlier too, being single, like, don't you see that it, doesn't it feel like two separate camps of people during this crisis? those that are sheltering in place with partners or spouses or children or whatever like that, and, and those that are doing this alone, each have their own strengths and weaknesses, you know, but one of the things that is, that is for those of us, and, and like that, that reader was saying, like, I'm, I'm 75 and, and, and single and doing this alone, you don't have that contact, that, that human contact as, as, as other folks are doing. And so that's, you know, that, that is hard. And to really find find ways to constantly talk to people every day to, to make sure you reach out either through Zoom or the telephone or whatever. And I love when I see people getting creative. They're being informed and they're staying, they're staying socially distanced, but they're sitting outside and they're bringing their lawn chairs. I was spoke to a trans elder the other day who is in Braintree and she and her senior housing complex, that bunch of the women bring out lawn chairs out in the courtyard and they're all 10 feet apart and they sit there and she said it's hard because half of us don't hear so well so we're shouting at each other but <laughs> so so you know people are doing that but yeah it is when you are aging alone it is is significantly it is significantly more difficult um and and to be able to re know that you've got to reach out a lot more to connect with folks intentionally this reader asked a question, my parents are in Florida and my brother and I have a Zoom call with them every few days to keep in touch. I feel like we only discuss the virus. I would like to talk about anything else with them because we're discussing the virus 
because discussing the virus causes anxiety for me. Is this unrealistic? And this is a question for people of all ages because I think there's that portion of every every contact I make with anyone by phone or by Zoom where you feel like you have to process the day's news or acknowledge it. Even just to say, how are you, implies right. a conversation about this. Yeah, yeah. I think we're all learning our limits, aren't we, about how much we can take with the news. You know, you can just take small doses of what's coming out of Washington before you start to go, oh. um, And so I, I think to that reader, I would almost say, be, you just take, take, be proactive and, and take control. When the conversation's been there for so much, say you're, for yourself, I, I need a little break from COVID for a bit. You know, what's, what's the weather like there? What, you know, just immediately have a list of other kind of topics to get into that you can bring up to kind of steer it away because what happens is we do start to go down that, that rabbit hole of being exposed to this too much. You know, remember we all went through this, <clears throat> I hate to make the parallels to 9-11, but you remember the beginning of 9-11, those first few days, we were like the entire world was glued to the television watching the same scenes over and over again and how, damaging that was to us on the soul to see those images. And I think we're, we're kind of finding ourselves there again, where everyone's just going right to the news and looking at the, at the numbers of cases and the death tolls and things like that coming up and up and up. And that's really, you know, that's, that's hard. So when you're having conversations with that, I think, and it may be if the parents are steering that, maybe it's some of their own anxiety to be able to say, are you feeling okay? Is this, you know, is the, and, and just checking in with them and then trying to get the conversation a little bit away from that because sometimes stepping away from that can kind of bring back a little bit of normalcy coming back to this, this moment. I'm thinking about, I talked to my dad last night on Zoom and there was a moment where I showed him something that's wrong, <clears throat> wrong with my ceiling and it's almost like every, everything else in the world disappeared that this is the way I can relate to him because he wants to help me fix things that are broken. Oh yeah, see that's, so, a, that's yeah, yeah. It's like, and and how are they doing? I, would, where did you say they are? Well, yeah. so my, my father and his partner are in Vermont and, you know, he, the two of them are very, they're, they feel pretty safe because they're in the middle of nowhere, but they're pretty isolated. But there is this temptation to say, oh, well, let's talk about the day's events. And, you know, he happens to be a handy guy. And I was like, look at my ceiling. And, and you know, it wasn't until we got off the phone later that I thought, wow, I was able to have a full conversation with anyone. Yeah. Um, without, you know, and, it, and, it, and it's not easy. So I completely relate to that because even with friends who are, you know, my own age with anybody, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's complicated, but. Um, and who would have knew, who would have thought that a, that a crack in the ceiling would give you such a breath of fresh air, yeah. such a lovely I, version, you know, <laughs> get more cracks quick. <laughs> yeah, right. Good, good that things are, are falling apart, <laughs> break, right? Break the sink of the, something in the sink and the plumbing so you can help him, have him help you do that too. <laughs> I, I have a question about community and how nosy to be. So, you know, you talk about reaching out and you talk about the network you have. In the very beginning of this, and, and this has continued, there's conversation about older people mm -hmm. that makes me uncomfortable because it's as if they're disposable. You know, mm -hmm. I don't like, I've talked about this in, in earlier sessions, I don't like hearing, oh, well, that person was older, that person had an underlying chronic illness, or that person, as if that justifies, um, you know, what has happened to a person. And I wanted to make sure my older friends and friends with, you know, chronic, chronic health conditions knew their value, right? Yeah. And to, to keep them, to, to let them know that that was important to me, that they know that. Um, there are people in my neighborhood who I know live alone who might be older. I, I would love to be supportive and to call and check in and leave notes, but I also, there's that fear of, especially in a city, like being nosy and weird. So how do you know who to approach, how to be a good neighbor, and what boundaries to maintain? Yeah, I think that, you know, I think it's it's so important because we we need to step up. We really need to really step up and be proactive there because at the beginning of this, it was frightening. I mean, there were, there were, there were terms, I was hearing, hearing terrible terms like, you know, boomer buster and stuff like that, or bo boomer remover, you know, the COVID-19 boomer remover, whatever. And, and people were, you know, it, it just, was just hard. I was, I was afraid of a backlash. I was really afraid of it. But now this awareness has come out and really this focus on looking the experience of, of, of older adults, of all older adults, and really with a critical eye, looking at the care that's being offered in long-term cares and, you know, and, and so I think all of that, that, that really close examination is important, but also now to realize 
and exactly and it's, again i'm so thankful that you're bringing this particular topic up of, of looking at older adults and and realizing that they may not want to ask for for something but what when you when you call them when you just call someone and or, or slip a little note under the door and sometimes it's that note that is people might be scared they're not going to answer the door if, if you're knocking on the door because everyone's afraid of, of catching something. And what I found with our calling system, first, people are not gonna answer the telephone the first time through anyway, because nobody answers the phones anymore because of all the stupid spam stuff that's out there. But if you leave a, name, a, you know, a number for them to call you back saying, just call just to check in, you know, if you find a way to reach your neighbors. Um, but I think one of the greatest things right now, beautiful things is, is people are returning to hand little hand, notes using the mail again and writing little notes and so if you know in your street where the older older adults are and you can just write a little a little note card and just say hey i'm meredith i just live up the street i would love to chat sometime you know or, or even to say like i'm i'm eight you're doing this by myself too i would love to chat it's sometimes what's really nice about this is when people can find that that we don't think help is coming it's like top down like younger people helping the older people like the older people the only ones that need help we all need it how lovely it is i've gotten so much out of these phone calls when i reach out to people i realize that in a blink of an eye 40 minutes goes by and we're just you know we're just talking and i've also seen this on, on the with older adults because we ask them, would you like to have a regular phone call? And, you know, most, almost half of them say, no, I'm, I'm okay. But then when I say, would you like to make phone calls to other, other people? Yes, yes, they, you know, they want to do that. And, and so the, there's so much that can be done in, in, those, in those moments. And I want to say that um, at the end of this, and maybe you can hint at this now, but I'm sure there are people who want to provide that kind of, um, you know, socialization for, for someone and make those phone calls. So, um, if, if at the end of this, you can tell us sort of where we can volunteer, you yeah. know, who needs help. Um, uh, and I want to get on to, to part uh, two of this. And, and a lot of you who left questions ask questions that sort of fuse both of these topics. So thank you for that. Um, this is a question that says, how can I, uh, a longtime meditator in Cambridge, Massachusetts, use mindfulness and meditation to support my older parents who live out of state? How can mindfulness help? And, and this is a, I, I connected this to a second question. How can mindfulness help me, a senior citizen and widower, deal with the free floating anxiety around COVID and required isolation? So, you know, these are two questions about, um, you know, isolation and sort of using this practice. So I don't know if you want to take them one at a time, but I think yeah. they're really important. Yeah, these are good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I did want to say one thing first about the, the person who said a widower, and, and we've just realized this too, that um, this, this isolation and this whole pandemic has just brought up, it's, it's re-traumatized a lot of people for a lot of different things. You know, I, I have an older friend who, um, his parents were uh, Holocaust survivors, and this whole thing has just brought back all this, this Holocaust trauma again, um, and it's really affected him. Um, and in a lot of our population, the LGBT community, it brings back the AIDS crisis, the AIDS pandemic. So, so that that has come. But something as simple that's universal for a lot of folks who have lost loved ones, this isolation brings that back all over again. The missing of that those people. We're we're doing the um, in the LGBT aging project. We are launching new bereavement groups because, and we're inviting back anyone that has been in any past LGBT bereavement group. So they can come back again because we know that this that those wounds feel very raw and very fresh all over again. So we want to bring people back to another free group again, and also reach out and start you know start new groups for for other people that have have lost um, lost loved ones. So um, so yeah, so that's really important. And, and so for the, for that person, like that's what I want to really try to seek out help. It's so nice to see so many organizations immediately switch. I am so impressed with. Um, Fenway, where you know where I work at, at Fenway Health, they in the fastest, of, in a, you know, a matter of a blink of an eye, switched over to everything from regular in-person medicine to, to telemedicine, and, and even the mental health providers all learning quickly how to do, do Zoom. That I was out there with some of them trying to teach them Zoom as well, and everyone without without batting an eye, like, okay, this is where we're going to go, and to see all that folks stepping right up into gear, so so reaching out with with providers to say, hey, I just want to check in and make sure you're kind of staying on top of this. Um, because some of those old wounds, just being aware of, of the feelings of missing and longing and loss and, and to, to acknowledge that and to, and to do something. So the other larger question about, about 
using mindfulness and meditation at this time, that is, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, the guidance that we all got was so minuscule. They were saying, wash your hands, stay six feet apart, and then it was stay home, don't go out, don't go out, don't do anything. Right, cover your whole, right. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> lock yourself in there. Um, but so all of this and, and nothing, guys, what are you going to do with all of these 12 hours of being inside? You know, there's only so much Netflix you can watch. What are you going to do? Um, and so I was, I've been thrilled because, you know, I, for those of us that, that, that practice in, in meditation, mindfulness have, have known the key right here, but to see that come out on a national level, to see more and more people, more people from the CDC reaching out saying mindfulness, find, get, get apps on your phone, get do this, find guided meditations. You know, and the reason is because what happens in situations like this is that our thoughts can go from this, this moment of like, you know, what's, what's happening here to immediately start spiraling and going down this rabbit hole because we start thinking, we're not sure when this is going to end. Are we going to run out of food? Every time you see another meat processing thing, oh my God, all the meats, we're going to, there's no more meat, there's no more bread, there's no more toilet paper all of this stuff and you start going down this thing and then, then we're, we're never gonna get back to the, our office again, money's gonna run out. And then you, you start to think, oh my God, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna be able to make my rent or my mortgage, I'm gonna lose my home, I'm gonna be on the streets. You spin down that, that thing of worrying about things that have not even come to us yet, um, the things that are so far in the future in mindfulness, those are the tools that come back into this into this moment and ground yourself in this moment because you know in this moment you're okay in this moment you can you you can feel your feet on the ground and and just kind of catch your breath again and so that's why you know we've been really getting out there <clears throat> and a lot of the gatherings we're doing with folks are doing little mini exercises just to help people reground reconnect themselves you know in back in this in this moment and and I'll just add too that when um, when I was finishing my last cycle of the MBSR, the mindfulness-based stress reduction. Um, it was right as everything was tipping and everything was going so crazy. And we're coming into the last class, class eight, you know, getting ready to wrap everything up. And I'm thinking, oh my God, like how am I gonna get people's attention on what's, on what's going on um, with all of what's happening in the world? Like their, their minds are there and not in everything that we've been doing these past eight weeks. And they've invested so much time and everything. So. So I asked people when they first came in to, you know, we're on Zoom and say, you know, chat me one word, like what, what word describes where you're at right now in the face of all of this? And as they were chatting, you know, fear and anxiety, the, you know, the, all this panic and all these really difficult words. And I was getting, my voice was cracking, I was getting upset. And then we went through and, and after that, then went into a, an exercise, like the, one of the ones I'd love to do with you. Um, and we went through that exercise and then I said, okay, tell me where you are, chat me another word right now. And it was like night and day. And I said, that's it. That's what happens when we utilize mindfulness to come back and get a toehold back in this moment, because in this moment, you're okay. So before we do the exercise, I just, I need to back up because this is going to be really like meditation 101. For, so I think part of my resistance over the years when I hear about friends meditating and a very close fr friend of mine gifted me a subscription to, is it Headspace? One of the, the mindfulness or a meditation apps you can download. And I've been like afraid to open it because <laughs> I, I don't, I'm very um, um, to-do list uh, focused. And in fact, have become almost more so during this because even if my to-do list is wake up, shower, you know, fold a piece of laundry, just to feel like the day has, has, um, boxes I can check. It's like my way of feeling in control. And when I think about meditation, I'm like, what is, what is the goal? Like, where is my, how do I win? How do I win? How do I win and what if I can't, what if I can't stop thinking? What if I can't stop that spiral? Um, how do you, like, what counts as truly being in a meditative state when you believe you're someone who probably can't stop thinking about toilet paper supplies, et cetera. Yeah. Well, I think there, there's so much, you know, there's so much in, in there, uh, in, in, in what you're saying. And I think that, and especially it doesn't surprise me, it's very, you're a journalist, you're going to be going on to-do lists and deadlines and things like that. So your mind is mirroring that's that same thing. And so the thought about, you know, how do you, how do you reconcile having this stillness? We are, we are overscheduled and overstimulated constantly. So we're not used to, we're, we're go, go, go. Everything is is about doing, doing, doing. And we've been doing the, we've been doing the doing, doing 
from you know elementary school, everything like then getting to, to high school and getting out, getting to college and going for a degree and going all of these things and getting into, into a career. It's always doing, doing, and less emphasis placed on just being. So I think that it, no wonder there's a little bit of resistance for you because it's, it's, it's new territory. Like how do you just sit and be? Because I think it sounds like with you, Meredith, because you, you're so busy, then the minute that you stop that, it's like, shut, shut off and go to sleep. You know, it's like, you know, go, 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 stop. You're going to go to sleep. <laughs> and it's also like, what if I, ha what if I accidentally have a feeling? <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, you said something earlier on, and I've and forgotten how, how you put it, but um, uh, earlier on in our conversation about d difficult feelings or whatever like that, but it, that's the problem these days is no one is allowed to have any... Uh, difficult, uh, uncomfortable feelings, because the minute we do, we go right to this. We grab the phone, or we turn on Netflix, or we go to Instagram, or we go to Snapchat, we go to anything else other than sit and feel what, you know, what's coming up. And to really come back into this uh, opportunity to just to, to stop and to slow down and to feel and to sense. And so, you know, and you can take it in, you can take it in small doses and, and see, you know, in that moment, how does, how does that feel? Um, but, uh, and I was going to say something brilliant and then shh. <laughs> right, right. I want, I want to ask one more question from a reader before we get into this exercise, because maybe mm -hmm. this reader can do this exercise with us. And, and we're going to do a shorter exercise today. Please join us. Um, and if you're watching this after the fact, please join us after the fact. I'm really, this will be my, the day's challenge for me. I can check it off my to-do list. <laughs> um, but this one reader asks, I'm under day, under four, a 14 day quarantine because I was exposed to a relative who I do not live with who came down with coronavirus. I'm very distracted because of the anxiety that this uncertainty has created. What's the best way to stay focused so I can do meditation and mindfulness activities? So, uh, so they're saying that they're a, a close family member. I missed the beginning of that close family. I, I, member. I think what happened was they were exposed to someone who was exposed. And wow. now this person is in that 14 day waiting period, wow. yeah. waiting to see if something terrible is going to happen. Right. And they're wondering, how do I, how do I even stay focused enough and right. make this meditation and mindfulness happen? Right. So this is perfect. And th these are, you know, these are tools that when, when any, any kind of challenging thing is, has come up and your, your mind, whether you're excited about some, some news that you're going to get or, or difficult, challenging things or whatever like that, um, utilizing mindfulness to come back into this moment to see that, that the mind quickly keeps slipping away and going into the, you know, going down into this place of worry and catching your, you know, catching yourself. Um, <clears throat> Uh, what I was going to say to you a moment ago, too, that, that I had forgotten is that is you had said something about the, the quieting the mind or whatever like that. that it's the illusion that we, we, we get into, the, come to this place where the, suddenly the mind is still and quiet and there's not a sound in there, you know, but crickets. No, you know, it, it is, the, the mind is naturally busy and it's working with that and kind of bringing that, bringing that back. And the same thing, you know, what this reader is saying that they're worried about that and those, you can't shut those worries out but it is just meeting those when those words, Oh, there it is. There's that word. It's okay. You know, and breathe into that, you know, and then come back and come back to, to, to an anchor or something like that. So we, we could do that. You want to do that? Cause this, this, the exercise yeah. we, we talked about doing really applies to exactly that, that, that question. Okay. Um, so, so, and this is exactly what I did with it, with the folks at the, at the end of the, um, the, the class of the last cycle of MBSR of coming in on the day, the whole kind of world's going crazy you know, and how do you go with all of that? And I'm sure they were all been sitting watching the news and then come boom, right into class. So, um, so just coming in and what we're, what we're gonna try and do is just kind of get a little toehold into this, into this moment. So, so my, my instructions or invitation, not instructions, in my invitation is to just simply just get in a comfortable position wherever you are. And this is to all our, all our listeners out there as well. And then, um, and then just letting your eyes close if that feels comfortable. And for some people, they, they don't like having their eyes closed and, then, and, and having their eyes with a soft gaze a few feet in front of you. Um, and if you're doing live with this right now, just turn away from the computer because that can be any movement on there, any light is, is distracting. So just have a soft gaze in front of you, but turned away. Um, so then just sitting here. And then just allowing yourself just to settle in. And one of the first things to be able to do is just to simply 
look for the body sensations right now, just grabbing this first little toehold into this moment by sensing you know, this body and what, what the body is feeling. And one of the easiest things is just the feeling your feet on the floor and just seeing if you can get a sense of feeling if you've got socks on, can you feel the fabric of the socks or your shoes? Noticing if you can feel the floor underneath, can you sense if it's a carpet or hardwood floor? And then starting to look for other sensations in, in your body. I think this is really important. We, we are such a, a culture that's so disconnected from our body and coming back into this, this experience of being in a body and just honoring that experience and honoring those sensations. And so we felt the feet on the floor and then looking for other sensations like is, is the, the, in the sit bones and the pressures around there as, as the weight of our body kind of sinks into the chair and feeling the contact between your body and the chair and seeing where you feel that contact and the, underneath the base of the legs and the buttocks. And then just allow the sink and sensing the softening of your shoulders and the softening of your face. And just noticing what your hands are touching. Are they holding each other? Are your hands on your lap? Do you feel the warmth of the skin? And then also expanding out. And there's other anchors that we can use to kind of bring our attention to, to really continue to stay right in this moment here. Just beginning to listen to the sounds that are around us. And first, maybe the sounds closest to you, just the simple sound and the beautiful sound of your own breath. And there's just a way to breathe that even if someone was, was sitting right, well, of course they wouldn't be sitting next to you right now, but if they were at six feet away, they wouldn't even hear you breathing, but you, that's just the simple sound of the only you can hear of your own breath. And just letting your attention rest on that sound of your breathing. the sound of the inhalation and the sound as you exhale. And then expanding outwards, what other sounds that are right around in your area? Do you hear, if you're sitting in front of the computer right now, do you hear, is there, is there a little fan in that computer making a sound? Do you hear that? Do you hear lights or other sounds in your room? Are you sheltering in place where you hear sounds in other rooms around you in your same building or your same home? Do you hear movement and activity? Do you hear television or radio? Do you hear footsteps? And then expand that out a little bit and see if you can to even extend that further out. Can you hear the outside? Can you hear any cars if there's cars going by? Can you hear are there any noise of probably not so many people outside, but do you hear birds? Do you hear traffic? Do you hear anything outside your building? And just giving this opportunity for our attention just to rest in these different sounds that are around us. And then another, another place for our attention to rest is just with the experience the sensations of our own breathing. So just noticing the sensations of the air coming into your mouth or into your nose. So if the air it's coming in through your nose, just feeling as it passes by all the little hairs in your nostrils. And just looking for as many sensations as possible. You feel that moving up and down into the back of your throat. 
And if you breathe in through your mouth, do you feel the air passing over your tongue and your teeth and your gums? And then feeling that going down into the back of your throat. And then feeling that air coming down and in and filling your lungs. And as your lungs fill with air and they expand, it kind of pushes the ribs outwards and you feel your stomach expanding and you feel the contact with your shirt or your sweater, whatever you're wearing. And then at some point, as you're doing this inhalation, you just notice this very gentle pause when the breath has come to the end of its completeness of its, as it's completed its, its full inhalation. And there's that gentle pause. And then the breath turns around and comes out as an exhale. And just following that out, following all of those sensations as the breath is leaving again, feeling it coming back out through the throat, back out through the nose or mouth, And maybe you even notice a slight temperature difference. The breath is often a little warmer as it's leaving your body than it was when it was coming in. And so we just stay with this. We just look for as many of these sensations as possible. And then what you notice as we're doing this is that the, is the busy mind is like, as you're saying, Meredith, the, the, the planning, we start immediately going into that place of organizing our to-do list or what we're gonna cook for dinner or you know, all the tasks that need to be done, and deadlines. And the minute that you do that, you're like, oh, there we go, I'm planning. Oh, I'm worrying. Just noticing, just noting that. And then without any judgment or any beating yourself up, just coming right back to whatever that anchor was of listening to the sounds feeling your feet on the floor or feeling that breath entering your body and all those sensations with your breathing. And just come back and you begin again. And you just stay with that for a moment until the mind wanders off and it will wander off. Our minds are busy. So, and especially at a time like this when there's so much worry, every time you start to get worried about something, go up, oh, there you go again, it's okay. And they come back to the breath and begin again, or come back to sounds and begin again. And then each time the mind wanders off, we just bring it back with gentleness and with kindness, and we simply begin again. And so as we close out this brief practice, just seeing if you're able to Stay, Meredith, with the next three full breaths. Stay with the breath from beginning to end. See if you can keep your attention right there from the beginning to the end three times. And then just before you even open up your eyes, just asking a simple question, how am I right now? How am I in this moment? Better. Yeah, yeah, let your eyes open up now if they were closed. So, so you see what, you know, what happens when we're doing that is we're, we're interrupting, we're putting basically, we've got these neural pathways that, that go through um, that when we come into moments of stress or anxiety and we start to go through a whole kind of condition responses and we get worried and, you know, and, and the whole, the, our whole stress system kind of kicks into gear. And what we're doing here is we're putting a roadblock and we're kind of re-diverting that and, and putting a new pathways here to just really tap into the parasympathetic nervous system. That's the rest and relax that, you know, that's the, the slowing down. You know, the sympathetic nervous system is though, that's a fight or flight. That's gonna, oh my God, the pandemic, I gotta do this. I've gotta go get toilet paper and I've gotta get all of this and flour and blah, blah. You know, when you catch yourself doing that, you're gonna go, okay. And then uh, doing something to kind of 
in to, to put that detour and to do that roadblock there and say, okay, let me bring in, let me, let me let this other system come in and just having a moment just to kind of catch your, you know, catch your breath and it will come back again. You just, each time your mind starts to go and they, oh, okay, you know, come back into this and just kind of, kind of catch up and come back into, into this moment. So how did it feel to you? It, there's a thing, and I wanted to ask you, of course, because my mind was wandering a little bit. Yeah. Um, and that's okay. It's okay <laughs> to let it do. Yeah. I mean, well, one thing was when you asked me to listen to sounds, like there, there's a couple, they live above me, and it turns out the, the guy and the couple um, was a Globe intern years and years ago. So, uh, and he's now a grown up, and, and I could hear their footsteps, and I felt, I always feel safer when I hear their footsteps oh. because they exist, right? And I know they're there and if anything happened, I could call them. And um, so when you asked for me to sort of take in my scenery, just hearing their footsteps, I thought yeah. I'm, I'm not disconnected from the world. Um, one thing that was difficult for me was when you were talking about feeling your feet on the ground and the, the first week or two of this, I saw a lot of articles written about people who were saying they had heartburn, their chest was tight. Was it a symptom? Was it panic? And that, and often my entire psyche and fear of everything is right here, right in my chest. Mm -hmm. And um, it's almost as if there's no other part of my body, right? Like that it's like my shoulders go up. And I noticed that that when I opened my eyes, my, my body was a little lower than when I had, had my eyes <laughs> open. So like, like have, sort of feeling all parts of my body, it was a little bit different and harder for me because I think I'm often up here and yes. sort of yeah, 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 yeah. We are so disconnected, and you know, one of the things in the in the MBSR program is is one of the formal practices, the body scan, and people are so disconnected from their experience of being in a body. They're just, you know, the body just all it serves is just to cart the mind around, you know, like boom, you know, go here to here, and we we've we've forgotten that, and especially for our older adults, because there's so much frustration when the body stop, you know changes and it's not able to do the things that it could do when it was 18, 19, whatever like that. And we get frustrated with that. But then to just to allow these moments to come back into it and to feel that. And, you know, I actually felt that when you were talking about the warmth that you felt about the comfort of hearing the footsteps on your head. And I hope you'd like sense of like how great that was like to allow yourself like, wow, that was really nice to allow that comforting feeling of just a simple sound of what that what that means you know means to you well i think they're always worried about bothering me with their footsteps and, mm -hmm. and i always try to tell them it's not a problem you know yeah. it's um uh so you know one of the things i think about with meditation and and these practices is bringing it back to what we talked about at the very beginning how this has this pandemic has affected marginalized groups so differently and that privilege really you know, people have access to some things that other people don't. And even when we're talking about talking to friends and family and older people on Zoom, you have to have, you have to have, you know, a computer or a phone to do that. Mm -hmm. I think about the access to this and how, how someone like you or, or, or anyone can bring these exercises to people who might not generally have access to them. Yeah. So, so. Yeah. So this is, so that's, that's really good. And, and, um, um, and I think too, and you're such a great example about this too, of, of like, how do you lean into something that you've kind of resisted for so much of your life? And so for folks that are out there that are feeling at this time a little stressful, well, the, you know, they, they, they can't snap right into this full-blown meditation practice when they haven't done it before. So right now is a time of like, is, is people just to find places where there's guided, you know, guided meditations. And I think too, the other thing that's so important right now is, yeah, you could listen to, you know, recordings and you can, you can search for things on smartphones and, and apps and things like that and all kinds of recordings, but a sense of community and connection is really, is really important. Um, and what's, what's amazing that has happened in a lot of, this, a lot of some of the great meditation teachers, you know, all over John Kabat-Zinn all the way down, have just opened up access. Normally to have it be in an audience with them is like really difficult, you know, retreats and stuff like that. They're doing, they're all doing live thing, daily live, um, and, and where, where, there's, where there's completely free. So, um, but I think that one of the easiest things, most tangible things is for people to just find places where they could join in, um, in any guided sessions. And I know I can suggest, and we can, we can post this um, for, for follow-up for folks, but I know it, it, at the Mindfulness Center at Brown University, every single day there's something, whether it's like, you know, 
uh, guided meditations or, or guided yoga practices, or they have these um, uh, pauses, these, the, these kind of mindful pauses that happen uh, on Tuesdays and Thursdays and things like that that are really nice and other people, anyone can come. There's no charge, you know, you can come in to that. Um, and also at UMass Memorial at, at our, the Center for Mindfulness there, twice a week there, they're open, they're doing these global guided meditation <clears throat> things. So you're there with other people um, and getting instruction too. So some of those days and some of the di different campuses, you know, offering various levels of, of guidance and other times it's just being together. So people can start to, to find out, you know, I think those things are really nice because then you get a sense that you're with other people <clears throat> in this. Uh, you know, other people, they can just find, you know, also find recordings, you know, on their own and just kind of allow themselves to, to go through and, and um, guide themselves. I want to ask one more reader question, um, which sort of relates to a previous question, but I think it's important. Uh, given we're stuck in inside with our family, trying to uh, comply with the stay at home and stay safe, Rule, do you have suggestions for remaining calm and mindful when a partner is having a freak out and overreacting to something minor? It happens to all of us with the tension um, of wondering if we're going to fall ill, financial stresses, everything. Um, I like this idea of we're not all going to be calm and we're all not going to be freaking out at the same time. So how do you sort of manage yourself when someone else is not in great shape? Yeah, it's the same. It's similar to the the, call, the other question that you had earlier by someone they're talking to their parents in Florida and their parents keep going back to this place of like going back. Oh, did you hear this? Did you hear that? Everyone wants to hear the, the, the horror stories of, of COVID-19. But you know, when when some person is ex experiencing that, you know, to try and meet them and to, to recognize it that that they're feeling that this is this is stressful, but then to begin to slowly kind of bring them back <clears throat> because what they're doing is they're going down that same place, that same rabbit hole of of worry. And and most of the time it's about things that have not even don't even connect with them or that it's something that's in the future, but coming and having them come back to this, you know, to this moment. And whether you can just simply divert them and say, let's, you know, especially if they're if they're sheltering a place together, any kind of distraction is so helpful to go out and you know what, let's just let's take a walk together, you know, and you know, anything like that that kind of gets their mind off of that and onto something, you know, onto something else. You know, you did it so beautifully. It wasn't even a stressful situation, but you immediately like, like, oh, let's look at the crack on the ceiling and what can we do? Like taking someone's attention off of that. So anyone that's feeling real, kind of real stress is like, how can you divert that away from of, of that? You know, honor, it's not denying that at all. You know, and, and sometimes, it, it, sometimes it, it starts by saying, you know, how do you feel? And, and, and I think it's, it's helpful for sometimes for people to say, wait, you know, where do you feel this? Where, you know, where do you feel this in your body, this, this worry? Just so you're acknowledging that that feeling is real. Um, and then saying, okay, you know, let's, let's, you know, let's breathe together, do something like that of kind of getting them, you know, off and, and, and away from that in a chance so that you can both do this because you're, you're right. You don't want to get in a situation where you're both going down that, both going down that hole. Like, I feel like there needs to be like a, my turn, kind of, <laughs> you know, when I have that with single friends, when we call each other, it's like somebody's up, somebody's down. And yeah. Yeah. And we, you know, we're, we're, we're all in this, we're all in this together, but I, I do think it's important to acknowledge that people, yeah, they are frightened and it's, and it's okay to feel frightened. We're not masking any of that because all those emotions and feelings are real and, and to know where it's landing in the body, but then to say, okay, you know, let's just kind of, let's just kind of breathe and, and come back into this, what we've got right here and making a meal together, something like that, seeing how that, that does. Well, I know we have to wrap up and I promise to everyone who's watching and listening, I'm gonna get a list from Bob of places where volunteer work can be done, where there might be free access to some of the exercises we talked about. Uh, you know, definitely if you want to spend your time helping other people right now and don't know where to put that time and energy, I'm sure you can help us uh, send us. Yeah, I'm going to send, I'm going to give you stuff for, um, you know, for, if people just want to do, you, yeah, you have asked a great question yourself there, Meredith, about like if the people want to reach out to, to older adults, you know, and, and in general, like Friendship Works is doing, so that's their whole mission is to, is to connect volunteers with older adults. So I'll put that information, but if folks want to do specific with LGBT older adults, to connect with us, I'll give you all information about the Mindfulness Center at Brown and the and the um, also at UMass Medical, uh, UMass Memorial Health Center about the Center for Mindfulness there too. So I'll give you all of those all those programs. So we'll get it all out there. And the LGBT Aging Project's main number. If folks want to learn more about the drop in, uh, our weekly drop in or our bereavement groups, I'll give all that to you so your readers can get that. And I'll be putting that in. Um, we'll do 
we'll sort of move this into a Q&A on bostonglobe.com online, but also if you go to the love letters column, boston.com slash love letters, you'll see a newsletter um, area and you can sign up for the newsletter there and I'll definitely put this out in the dispatch in the newsletter. And um, of course, there's always the Love Letters podcast to listen to, which is not at all meditation, but it's just a distraction. Perfect. Just a yeah. distraction. Yeah. I want to thank Garden Streets for coming in today and uh, being our presenter and sending green things to people who might want it. Bob, thank you so much. Oh my uh, God. No, thank you. This is this has been so much fun. I am I am spending the rest of my day with my shoulders like Yay. four inches lower than they started. So thank you to this and thank you. I say this every week, but thank you for. Um, everyone for coming because this is a weird, scary time and I am scared a lot and knowing that people are sort of sharing the experience in positive ways and thoughtful ways is helpful. So Yeah, and their questions were fantastic too. That really shaped this whole hour. So that was great. So thank you guys so much and we'll see you next week.